hey, Mr. President, if we put if we put tariffs on all all of our allies, you know, uh, that's counterproductive because if we shoot all of our allies to get to China, China wins. You know, I mean, so, sure. so maybe that wasn't maybe what he wanted to hear, uh, but but it was my duty to tell him. I was actually thinking about you this morning because I know this isn't totally the message of the book, but you know, you sort of talk about uh, isolationism and sort of this this sort of belief that one can disengage or sort of go it alone in the world. And you know, waking up in in Texas today, essentially being snowed in uh, under a, a water boil advisory, and, and most of my friends are without power. Yeah. Primarily because Texas decided to sort of go it alone. It, it's not on the uh, on the electrical grid connected to the other states. And there's there's sort of some argument that, you know, doing such a thing makes you stronger because you only have to worry about yourself. But it also sort of is a decent reminder of what life without allies or collaboration or interconnectedness looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a strange time. We're sort of seeing these ideas that maybe make sense in an op-ed or in an argument sort of get tested under the real stresses of a of an unpredictable world. Right, right, exa- exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering, are you comfortable telling the story of of how you ended up uh, hearing about the obstacle is the way? Yeah, no, I'm fine with doing that. I'm fine with doing that. Yeah, I'd I'd love to I'd love to hear it. I've got my copies, man. I got I got all three of your books right there, man. Oh I no way! I don't know if you can see them, yeah. But I'll tell you, I, lo- I love your books, really, honestly. Thank you. I mean, I, I think they're they're great. I mean, I love like kind of the short chapters, man. You know, they're great, be- you know, bedside books, and and um and you know, it's really it's just a strong, it's a great message for the, these days. You know, my my daughter is uh she's probably thirty three now, but she calls her generation the start my orange generation. You know, hey, will, will you start my orange for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean start start peeling it? Yeah, start peeling it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's uh. Well, I mean, look, the pandemic has been that. It's like suddenly, you know, uh, I used to eat my lunch at a restaurant every day, and now I'm packing my lunch for the first time and you know, making yeah. my own lunch for basically the first time in my adult life. It, it is it is sort of forcing some self reliance, which which will hopefully counteract some of the uh, the millennial start my orange uh, impulses. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, so how did you end up first hearing about the obstacle is the way someone gave it to you, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, Sheikh Taknoon, who's a, a friend of mine and we worked together on a number of initiatives in, in the Middle East and beyond. Uh, we, we, he's, he's an author himself. He's very intellectually curious. And, and he said, Hey, I just, I just read this great book called the obstacles, the way, and I, and I'm going to bring it to you next time. And he did, he brought it to me next time. And, and uh, you know, he, he had it marked for me on the pages that he thought were most relevant to the, to the, to the problem sets that we're working on. And, and uh, so that's how I became familiar with your work and, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, the, uh, and as well as the ego is the enemy and now the, the lives of the Stoics, you know, so I, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan. It's it's so incredible to me because I I also have had the the, the unique opportunity of meeting him. I met him through Robert Greene, uh, who who wrote the Forty Eight Laws of Power. Yeah. They, he's yeah. he's obviously a huge reader, and so he sort of reaches out to authors, I guess. But it was a surreal experience for me to to, to go uh, to Abu Dhabi and, and and meet him because there was something you know. So I, I you know they drove me in. I, I went to his his palace, and uh, it was all very modern. Uh, and this was this sort of stoic thing. Him, he was all very modern. You know, it's this beautiful house. He has these TVs everywhere and cutting edge technology. You know, there's nice cars parked out front. And yeah, I, I also felt something very timeless. Where it's like you're you're literally meeting a member of a royal family, and he's he's just soliciting sort of artists and intellectuals the way that a prince might have done 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. And, and I, that must have been a feeling you've got as you traveled around the world, meeting these sort of heads of state. On the one hand, we're in the 21st century. On the other hand, very little has changed. <laughs> I think, I think that's right. You know, and, and, uh, and in, in these, in, in these countries, the power structures are quite different, but I think it's, it's great that, you know, that, that uh, someone who's in that position of influence is intellectually curious, right? I mean, the danger is when do you have 
a despot, right? Who thinks, Hey, I, I know everything already, right? And yes. I know what's good for my people. And, and, uh, and it's just really determined to keep himself in, in, in power. So I, I think, you know, I think that UAE is, is, has been kind of a force for good in the region in large measure because the, the leadership there, uh, Sheikh Taknoon, but also Mohammed bin Zayed is, you know, they're, they're very engaged. They're, they're always talking uh, to, to others and listening to others. Yeah, it's interesting. It, when I was writing Lives of the Stoics, I was looking at some of the early Greek Stoics and I was, it was interesting their relationship with these sort of kings and princes that they were advising. There was there, the idea of like, oh yeah, a leader has to be informed and a leader has to be intellectually curious is again, this thing that that people have been wrestling with for, for 2000 years or, or, or more. And and how unique, I mean, Marcus Aurelius being one of the only sort of philosopher kings that ever existed, just you you would think that, you know, being powerful would go hand in hand with being intellectually curious, but it's probably the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think a lot of people who get into positions of power, you know, uh, do, do so in, in a way that that uh, demands self-promotion, right, that, that demands uh, at least portraying themselves as extraordinarily knowledgeable, right? But in, it's really important that a leader be, be intellectually curious and be humble, right? To, right. to know that you know, nobody's omniscient. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and when you're dealing with this, certainly complex challenges and, and also when you're trying to, to take advantage of opportunities, um, that you need a kind of an interdisciplinary approach. You need to bring people together to help understand uh, the complex problems and, and what the possibilities are. Yeah, there's a, there's a great quote from Epictetus where he goes, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. And, and <laughs> as I've talked to sort of CEOs and leaders and politicians over the years, I've sort of said a version of this, which is if you think you know everything, in a sense, if you think you know everything there is to know, in a sense, you're right, because it becomes impossible for you to learn anything else. And so it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy where if, if you think there's stuff left for you to learn, you're also right, and you can continue to grow and learn. And if you think you know everything, which I think a lot of these sort of intuitive by the gut leaders sort of go almost probably come out of the womb thinking, that's also a self-fulfilling prophecy because they, they, they're not open to learning or, or being proven wrong in any way. Absolutely. I mean, this is why I think the study of history is so important, right? Because I think the study of history is in, in, in many ways an exercise in humility because you, you recognize that nobody has everything figured out, right? And, and you, you understand better the complex causality of, of events, the, you know, the, the human aspect of, of problems and, and life experiences that, that, that defy you know, any kind of predictive ability, right? So I, I, I think that's why, I'm, you know, and no surprise that a historian would advocate for the study of history, but, of course. but I, think, I think the study of philosophy and the study of history both are immensely important for leaders. Yeah, I was thinking about that quote from from your friend and colleague General Mattis. Uh, it's in it's in Call Sign Chaos. He says it's not just that you have to read. He's like if you haven't read hundreds of books about your domain of of battle or 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 industry or specialty, he says you're functionally illiterate. And I, what I liked about that is it's sort of raising the bar. It's not like oh, I read one book or I scanned a few reports about something it has to be this deep sort of immersive experience in something uh, to, to I'm, I'm sure, you know, your sort of lifelong study of the, uh, of war, but specifically the, the Vietnam war, you're, you're probably just, you're, you're, you're not only still unearthing things about it, but, but your understanding of it is probably still relatively early. Like we're, as you, as you deep dive in these subjects, you realize that you're really only on a shoreline of kind of a vast ocean of, of potential understanding of this topic. Right, I and mean, what, what history can do is, is it can help you ask the right questions. And I think it can help you think uh, in, in, uh, in ways that allow you to employ historical analogies, but I think you have to do that as well with, with uh, a degree of, uh, of caution and, and humility because you know, no situation is exactly the same. Uh, but but I think you can at least avoid making some of the same mistakes. And, and I read about this in Battlegrounds about how I took with me you know, into the White House, at least a determination to at least make different mistakes than right. those that I had written about <laughs> during the uh, uh, during the period in which Vietnam became an American war. 
Yeah. Bismarck says, you know, any fool can learn by experience. Let's learn from the experiences of others. I think if you're not sort of starting at least where everyone else left off, what you're doing is making unnecessary mistakes for the second time. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. You seem like a, a, a pragmatic reader, though. I, I saw a quote from you in an interview, and I think you were cribbing a professor of yours where you said, a historian doesn't read book. They, you said, historians don't read books, they use books. Walk me through how you think about books in, in that way. Yeah. Well, I, I think that really gets to the point that I was going to make when you mentioned uh, the, the General Mattis quotation. It's not enough just to read books. You have to read books purposefully. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're reading books purposefully, what you're trying to do is to, to kind of solve a problem or to deepen your understanding of a particular issue. And then when you engage with a book and then you can place that book in the context of other books that are related to that subject, that's when I think you begin to develop knowledge, you know, the knowledge that is necessary you know, to make wise decisions and, and, to, and, and knowledge that is necessary to consult with others and, and to do so in a way uh, in which you, you ask the right questions. Right. And, and, um, and so I, I think reading purposefully is immensely important. And I mean, some books are more conducive to this than others. I mean, if, if I'm reading a, a book on a historical topic or a contemporary challenge to international security, I typically try to break the book, right? I read the introduction, I read the mm -hmm. conclusion, I read the first and last paragraphs of each chapter. And then, and then if a, a chapter really interests me, then I dive into it, you know, and I read the whole thing. Now, of course, you know, when you're reading Tolstoy, you read it, you read it from front right. to back, you don't skip around, but, but, but I think, um, I think reading purposefully is is key, and and I think that's an important skill. You know, I remember when I was when I was in uh, I was taking a staff course on my way to graduate school, and I went to the the library at Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, and I signed out these VHS ta tapes for a speed reading course hosted by Dick Cavett. <laughs> and and uh, I'll tell you, it's the best investment of time I ever made. You know, because of course, I mean, a graduate student in history, you're doing a heck of a lot of reading. Sure. And if you can, and if you can read purposefully and efficiently, I think that helps. I, I find this particularly true for like philosophy or if I'm trying to read some like Greek play or like, let's say someone, you know, hears that, you know, history of the Peloponnesian War might help you understand the, the, the jostling between the United States and China. You know, don't just go buy that book off the shelf and, and think you're going to read it if you've never read some work of ancient history before. I, what I like to do is I read the Wikipedia page first and then I read articles about it. I, you got you to gotta get the basics of, of what's happening first so then you can really understand yeah, what's right. going on. And then I also think, and I'd be curious as a, as, a, as a historian, how, like when I read, I tend to skip over lots of dates and places. I don't worry about pronouncing names. Yeah, I, right. just, I just want to get to the, the point uh, I want to get the message. I want to use it. I'm not. I'm not trying to impress anyone. Yeah, hey Ryan, this this is why I really like your your books. I mean, you make your you make philosophy and Stoic philosophy relevant and and accessible. And a lot of other authors do that. I think well on other topics, like you mentioned the Peloponnesian Wars. Uh, Don Kagan's one volume of that is brilliant or his essay on it in the book called on the origins of war and prospects for peace right he's a you know he's an he's a he's an ancient historian who wrote a multi-volume history of the peloponnesian war but like who's going to read that these days sure. not that many people but but so i think looking around for books like that to provide the context and and you know I, you know I, I we're talking about don higginbotham one of my advisors you know who said uh you know, who said HR historians don't read books, they use them. He also had a great line when I finished my written exams in history for the for the doctorate. And he, and he said, uh, he said, congratulations, you now know more history than you will ever know. And, and, uh, and what he was basically saying is, hey, don't worry about the knowledge, right? The specific you know, knowledge of facts and dates and, and so forth and personalities. Uh, but 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 you know, really what, what a degree in history should do is, is just teach you how to think. And yes. And, uh, and how to think in maybe the way that Sir Michael Howard, who's a great military historian and just passed away last year, uh, you know, he said that you should study history in width, depth, and context, right? In, in width, so you can see really the change in continuity, because I, I think history is largely about change and continuity. As the historian Carl Becker said, memory of past and anticipation of future should walk hand in hand in a happy way. Right. And and uh, and I think oftentimes we neglect continuities in our experience, the human experience. I think I'm sure you see this with the applicability of this uh, of Stoic philosophy to today. 
Uh, and we think that everything's new, right? Yes. Everything's you know, everything we encounter is a is a novel sort of ex- experience. And and uh, and then he said to study in depth, in depth, so you understand the complex causality of events. And and as he describes it, the tidy outlines of history dissolve, right? And and you see the real effect that you know that emotion has on on uh, on history and and the course of, of human events and then and then and then and then he said to study in context to place whatever you're studying in a, in a broader context of if you're studying war right the relationship uh between war and society and the specific form of government the need to sustain popular will in a in a democracy for example so so i i think that that the study of history teaches us more than anything else how to think rather than what to think. If you're like me, you grew up eating the sugariest, most unhealthy cereal you could possibly imagine. You can't even wrap your head around how your parents allowed you to do this. And now that you're older, you want to eat healthier, you want your kids to eat healthy, but you still love the delicious taste of cereal. That's what I love about Magic Spoon. It's high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free, totally delicious. I just absolutely love it. 13 grams of protein, only five net carbs, zero grams of sugar. It's just the best cereal. I don't eat cereal in the morning most times, but I do have it for dessert a lot of days. Just absolutely great. We pick these wild blackberries on our farm. I eat that in there, but check it out. I think there's free shipping with your order. You can use code Ryan Holiday. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and this podcast. Seriously, it's legit delicious. Yeah, I was uh, with that quote from your professor who was saying you now know more than you'll ever know. I wonder if part of that, and I, I'd be curious if this is true in your experience, it's it's sort of, it's it, you you had this broad understanding of the sweep of history. So you kind of know where things are located. And then when specific things happen, then you can go, I need to go deep dive into this. For instance, when I was writing Stillness, I decided, oh, you know what might be, like, I was trying to think of a leader, a moment where a leader had been particularly sort of still, but but in in a very sort of crisis, high moving situation. And so I, I was like, you know what, I've read about the Cuban Missile Crisis before. Now I'm going to go do a deep dive in context of that to find out what I need yeah. to know. So do you find right. yourself referring back, doing deep dives Absolutely. in moments of... Yes, yes. And whenever I'm writing about something or thinking about something, I'm pulling like three or four different books down because I'll remember. I'll remember, yeah, I think I think th- th- yes. this vignette's in this book or, or this book uh, really has uh, has a good framework, you know, for understanding this 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 complex issue. Um, and I noticed that I noticed that in your writing, too. I don't know if it's uh, ego as the enemy or obstacles away. You, you cover Ulysses Grant mm-hmm. and you use, you know, use a couple of vignettes about you know him getting a photograph taken. I remember yeah. and like, you know, the, and the glass crashing around him. I thought about this because this, this, you're talking about stillness. But then all these other examples in his life where he was, you know, he he he, he was sort of, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, a little bit fatalist, you know, yeah. and and uh, and 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 was sort of unflappable uh, in, in very, in very, uh, you know, what others would regard as as harrowing, desperate situations. So um, and, you know, I, I love that approach to, you know, to leadership. Right. I mean, I. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I think you might write about Rommel, too. I used to mm-hmm. teach him. I taught a symposium on the North Africa campaign as part of a military history course I taught at West Point. And and I think what distinguished him more than anything else is where others saw only difficulties. He saw possibilities. Right. And uh, and with our regiment in Iraq, uh, it, it, the third Armored cavalry regiment in, in Iraq, in a very difficult area with a lot of violence. And, and uh, it was a base for Al Qaeda in Iraq. We had a big sign in our command post, right? Where, you know, where are the opportunities and how do we exploit them? And that was the question to ask all the time. Because, you know, bad things happen in combat, Ryan. You know? Of course. But, but what you want to try to do is, is to understand how what has just occurred can be turned to your advantage. Yeah, speaking of Rommel, to go to the the idea of like you sort of know where stuff is located. He had that that fingertip feel. I won't yeah, do the, yeah. the German word because I I'm, I'm terrible at pronunciations. But finger spitzing the fuel is what yes. it is. Yes, he he kind of <laughs> had that fingertip feel where for how things were going to go. And I think the more you read, the more functionally literate you become. The more right. you have a fingertip feel for where the right quote or anecdote or or piece of data or campaign to study to help you with whatever right. the the obstacle you're currently experiencing is. 
Absolutely. And this could be very practical. I, I read about this in the conclusion of Battlegrounds because I, I tell the story of when I was <laughs> when I was leaving uh, to go to the White House quite unexpectedly. Right. The president hired me on you know, President's Day in, in uh, 2017 after an interview of Mar-a-Lago. And uh, and I flew back on Air Force One. I didn't live in Washington. So they flew me on Osprey aircraft back to my house. Uh, I packed a bag and I went to work the next day, you know, in the, in the West Wing of, of the White House. Sure. But my, my future son-in-law was visiting us and I was pulling all these books down off my shelf to take with me. He goes, hey, what should you be packing clothes instead of books? Like, why are you taking all these books with right. you? And I said, well, whenever you know, I take on a new job, I try to learn from the experiences of those, you know, who, who had that responsibility previously. Sure. And I told the story about to, to my son-in-law, who was in the, the 75th Ranger Regiment at the time. I said, hey, you know, um, <laughs> before our, our unit deployed to Desert Desert uh, Shield and then Desert Storm, this is 30 years ago now, Ryan, I'm getting really old, man. And then, uh, you know, I, I read about you know, the North African campaigns. And then really strangely, our executive officer, a guy named John Gifford, he's cleaning out the office of the executive officer, which is always a mess in any military unit. The executive officer has all the stuff like that gets socked away, yeah. right? But he finds this paper, like crumpled up, like in the back of the back of the drawer, you know, and and um, and it's notes on combat actions in Tunisia and North Africa by Major General uh, Harmon and, and Ernest Harmon. And and um, it was like the Rosetta Stone for, for armored desert combat. You know, and, and it was all the lessons that he had learned in command of the second armor division. And, you know, technology had changed and so forth. Like the basics had changed. Right. And, and there were these just there were these insights that seemed kind of simple. Right. But he would say that, you know, uh, <laughs> armored battles in the desert are won by the, the, the side that shoots first. OK, that gets the first shot. in. Sure. Right? That's that's kind of good. He said a, a good a good uh, a unit uh, in, in, in engaged in armored battle has about eight to 10 plays that they can, that they can execute immediately, you know, and together. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he emphasized you know, fire distribution and control, all sorts of other things, but, but, uh, but, you know, <laughs> there's one saying, if it, if it takes a toothpick, use a baseball bat, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, sure. you know, when a you know, bump up, in other words, uh, to, to gain the initiative and, or an ascendancy of fire, uh, the Rommel papers read that way as well. Very practical, you know, so, solutions or Rommel's earlier book, Infantry Attacks. And so I, I think, you know, I think it's really important to study the past, that not just because it makes you more knowledgeable in a general sense, as I mentioned, and, and the ability to ask the right questions. But sometimes it can really help you in, in a very practical sense, prepare a team uh, to, to compete. And I think that applies, you know, in business as well as it does in, in the military. Yeah, I would say sort of, who, for whoever is listening, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what's just happened in your life. You've just gotten married. You've just lost someone you loved. You've just been drafted to, to play in the NBA. You've just been elected president. You've just made a million dollars. You've just lost a million dollars. Somebody has written a book about that exact thing, right? And, and probably right. someone who did it right has written a book about it and somebody who did it wrong has written a book about it. And then a historian has written about it in context. And to, to not avail yourself of that knowledge because you're going to figure it out on your own is not just arrogant, but, but, um, masochistic in, in my opinion. Yeah, right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what, what is it, you know, the, the, what is the, the, uh, Gosh, uh, I think you already mentioned the Bismarck quotation, yes. you know, about learning about learning from the past. And and uh, and and I, I think that it is arrogant, though. I mean, the people who say, hey, all I need to know, man, is what is my my own experience. I mean, how that's that's pretty darn arrogant. Right. And it, the, the ego is the enemy, Ryan. <laughs> well, Seneca says, you know, to study philosophy is to annex all the ages into your own. And I think that's what we're doing is we're trying to go. The wisest people who ever lived have experienced something like this before. What do they yeah. figure out? Maybe they maybe they got it wrong, but we should at least start with their basic understanding of the problem and and uh, and, you know, speed things along if we can. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that if you don't have that historical knowledge, you're at a severe disadvantage, a significant disadvantage. And, and I think an example, I mean, an example that I read about in, in Battlegrounds is this this idea of a revolution in military affairs in the 1990s. It was really based on the premise that, hey, really, really, really this time, Things the next changed. war will be fundamentally different from all those that have gone before it. Right. right. It's going to be fast, cheap, efficient, ways from, from standoff range. 
And, and the, the language associated was, was so hubristic, right? Everything was dominance. Yeah. Full spectrum dominance, dominant battle space knowledge. And then and these, these catchphrases like rapid, decisive operations. That sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, if you're not for that, what are you for? Are you for ponderous, indecisive operations, right? I mean, so it's it was really a setup. This 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 orthodoxy in the 90s was a setup for the frustrations that we encountered in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was all because we were biased in favor of change and, and not cognizant enough of the continuities, continuities in the nature of war. Yeah, I've, I read um, I read uh, Lawrence Friedman's book and it's called The Future of War. I don't know if you read it, but he wrote he wrote that great book, Strategy. And he was yeah. sort of looking at how at every generation they thought things have fundamentally changed and are different. And right. how how naive that assumption turns out to be every single time. Yeah, I, I used to call it the vampire fallacy. It's because you can't kill it. It just keeps right. coming back. And and it's it, it's modern day, you know, the, the modern day manifestation of this this vampire began with strategic bombing theory uh, you know, in, in the early uh, 20th century. And uh, and 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 it just appears in a new guise about every 10 years. You know, I don't know what generation of warfare we're up to now. I think it's fifth generation warfare, sixth right. generation, you know, and and uh, and each one of these generations comes with you know a few new buzzwords, you know, but it's really the same argument. And 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 the continuities that they neglect is are, are kind of you know, four fundamental continuities about war. War is an extension of politics, right? Okay, so you think that's kind of like the that's like the Geico commercial, right? Like everybody knows that. Yeah. But, but what it really what that really means is, hey, you have to orient all of your efforts, military, diplomatic, economic, to to achieve a sustainable political outcome. Unless it's just a raid, war is human. And 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 uh, Ryan, you'll appreciate that. Obviously, war is fought for the same reasons Thucydides identified twenty five hundred years ago: fear, honor, and interest. War is uncertain because of its fundamentally interactive nature. There's no such thing as linear progress in, in, in war. And then war is a contest of wills, right? As, as um, you know, the, 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 the philosopher of war, Carl von Clausewitz said uh, in the 19th century, you know, that, that, that winning in war means convincing your enemy that your enemy has been defeated, right? And, and I think we have violated all of those continuities or neglected all of them in, in the recent wars that we've engaged in. And, and for people who are listening who are not soldiers, I, I would argue that that those those points you just raised are as much true in life and in business and in sports, too. And, and that's why ordinary people should study the history of war and the history of politics and the, the you know, um, the, the, these sort of grand campaigns of the past, because as different as they are, what you're what you're seeing is fundamentally human beings doing what human beings do. And there's lessons right. you can derive and apply to whatever it is that you're doing. Absolutely. This is, this is uh, you know, Carl Becker, who was a great historian. Who I already qu- quoted earlier about you know, the memory of past anticipation of the future, walking hand in hand in a happy way. He gave a great speech for the American Historical Association uh, in the 1930s, you know, and and in it, it the, the title was Every Man a Historian. And of course, he would have said today, every man and woman is sure. a historian. But uh, but uh, what, what he was essentially saying is that history is important to everybody because it's really just the record of things said and done. Right? <laughs> and, and, and that record it can inform, you know, our, 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 our decisions and and and, and help us uh, help enrich our, our experiences. So there's two two things that you brought up. One, the idea of sort of convincing your enemy they lost, and then we talked briefly about the Cuban Missile Crisis. To me, of all the the concepts that are applicable out of out of battlegrounds, the the biggest one, the sort of one that I think obviously makes sense in a geopolitical sense, but make a lot of sense just as a human being going through the world. You talk about this idea of strategic empathy, which yeah. is not just what do I want, what not just what do I want, but what does my enemy want, and how is my enemy going to think about what I'm doing and how does that interplay with what they want? And to me, the the, the Cuban Missile Crisis is this sort of apotheosis of, of, of that happening where Kennedy was the first one, the first American president in quite some time that was able to, to take the advice from his military advisors, think about it politically, and also just think about it as a human level, what is the guy across the ocean who also has his finger on the nuclear button? What is he thinking? And what's he thinking about what Kennedy's thinking? And that, that struck me as just 
strategic empathy at its highest and most uh, yeah. life and death. I'll, I'll t- it's it's an extremely important concept. It's a concept I you know that that you know, has its roots in in Sun Tzu's observation, right? That hey. You know that, that if if you know yourself, you know you'll you'll win half of the battles. If you know the enemy, you'll know half the battles. If you know neither, you'll lose everything, right? Yes. So, so but but uh, but the historian named Zachary Shore wrote a great book called A Sense of the Enemy, in which he develops this this idea of strategic empathy. It's essentially you know viewing you know these complex challenges that we're facing uh, from the perspective of others, and in particular, as you mentioned, our, our rivals and adversaries and our enemies. And, and, and what he also argues for, and what I argue for in the book, is to also pay attention to the emotions and the aspirations and the ideology that drive and constrain the other. The problem with you know, the lack of strategic empathy, what are described as strategic narcissism, is it's self-referential, first of all. Sure. And it doesn't acknowledge the agency or the authorship over the future that the other has. Uh, and, and this is why I think we fall into some of these cognitive traps. Uh, of 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 confirmation bias and uh, and and optimism bias and and self delusion really uh, and and we see this playing out I think in Afghanistan for example today right where uh, we didn't like the enemy that actually we were engaged with there so we conjured one up uh, and 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 made some assumptions about the enemy uh, and then uh, and then and then are, are leaving Afghanistan in a way that's empowering uh, our enemy and disadvantaging. Really, those who are trying to fight to preserve the you know the freedoms that the Afghan people have enjoyed since the end of Taliban rule in uh, 2001. Yeah, I, I see this with with artists and writers and entrepreneurs too, where if because these things sort of I think tend to select for a certain amount of ego, right? You're you're the person says I should be a famous artist or I should be president or I should be a powerful general. There's a certain amount of ego that attracts you to these jobs, but that ego is so dangerous because your thing now depends on your understanding of the audience, of the enemy, of the media. You know, you're having to be filtered through all these things. And so if if you don't understand, if this is all about you and you are living in this sort of reality distortion field, you're just never going to be successful no matter how brilliant, powerful, uh, well-armed you are, because fundamentally it's not about you. The other person has a say in what happens too, whether that's <laughs> Vietnam or the buying public or the stock market or public opinion, they, they have a say in what happens and you have to understand that. Right. And, 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 you know, a person's ego makes them vulnerable as well to manipulation, right? Yes. It's pretty easy to push the buttons to somebody who's an egotist, right? You can do that through, you know, sycophancy <laughs> or, or by, uh, by, by raising the, 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 the prospect that the individual might seem weak, you know, unless yes. they do fill, fill in the blank. Um, the other way that I think ego makes people susceptible is the way that I've seen really the Pakistani army leadership manipulate American leaders for, for way too long. Right. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is uh serial, you know, self uh, delusion. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think uh, what they, what, what I've seen them do is they just convince each one of these leaders, Hey, you will be the person, you will be the person who's going to convince me to change. Right. right. My yes. behavior. Right. And uh, and just work with me a little bit longer. Right. Just, you know, just continue to give us more aid. Be patient with us because, you know, you're really the one that's going to fundamentally change the relationship. And um, and I've seen a number of people fall for it. It's, it's really it's, what it is. It's, it's serial gullibility. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you sort of you can't con an honest man, you know, the saying. And I think an egotistical person is complicit in fooling themselves because they right. want whatever it is that you're selling them to be true, even though fundamentally it's not. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So when you when you think about this strategic empathy, it, it's not you're not saying like, oh, you never do. Uh, you never put yourself out there. You never try. You never exert your will. It's just I think you're saying you have to understand the facts on the ground and you have to understand how these things relate to each other. That's, and that's right. That's right. And and what strategic empathy does is it helps you understand the challenge you're up against better. It helps you compete more effectively. It allows you to challenge what are oftentimes implicit assumptions that underpin policies and strategies. And, and because they're implicit uh, and, and despite their flaws, they go unchallenged. Right. Uh, and so I, I think it's, for example, I think one of the, you know, one of the uh, more stark examples is this assumption that, that China having been welcomed into the international economic order uh, would would play by the rules, and and as China prospered, it would liberalize its economy and liberalize its form of governance. 
Well, that completely neglected really what, what the with the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party and the emotions and aspirations that drive the party leadership. So I think by viewing uh, the competition that we're in uh, with this authoritarian mercantilist model that the, that the party is, the party is promoting, you know, that, that by viewing it from their perspective, you then are able to craft a much more effective policy and strategy. Yeah. And it, just because something is good for the country as a whole, you have to think about how does this affect the individual decision makers who, who are currently in power and what the fantasy that you wish to be true is often at their expense. So it's, you know, I think this is a, a key point in the 48 Laws of Power. It's a key point in von Clausewitz, obviously, Thucydides. You have to, to me, what the core of strategic empathy is, is understanding what the self-interest or the incentives acting on the person who's on the other side of you Absolutely. is. Absolutely, yeah. A great example is the Kim family regime in North Korea, right? The only, <laughs> the only hereditary um, communist dictatorship in the world, right? And, and, uh, and so the, the two approaches that we've taken to, you know, to North Korea o- over time have been, you know, the sunshine policy, right? The sunshine policy that the idea that an opening to to North Korea, I mean, how could they be against that, right? right. I mean, they've got a, you know, the people are destitute, their economy is failing, you know, opening up will, you know, will, you know, will enrich the, the, the you know, the, 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 um, the people. But of course, Kim sees this as a disaster, right? Because it's a gulag state. It's a state in which uh, he's tr- he tries to insulate the, the North Korean people from reality, and he's is and has subjected them to, to to systematic brainwashing, right? Uh, I mean, you know, the, the worst threat to him is that North Korean people would think on their own. Uh, the and the other approach has been one of strategic patience, right? This this idea that hey, if you just wait long enough, right? I mean, that's the impossible state. It's going to collapse. Right. Uh, but but this is, you know, this is, again, I think, wishful thinking. I mean, the, you know, the Kim family regime does have a pretty tight grip on power based on the mechanisms it's put in place to to prevent uh, any any really organize, organized uh, opposition uh, to the regime. So uh, it is it is important to view, you know, to view competitions, uh, complex problems and challenges, as well as opportunities from the perspective of others, and then to and then to maybe list assumptions. I think a good example of this is about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whenever uh, just before the end of the Trump administration, and in the in the middle of this, you know, of this uh, this horrible you know spectacle, murderous spectacle, and the of the attack on the on the on the Capitol. So it didn't get much press, but the administration uh, uh, declassified uh, one of the foundational documents to the Indo-Pacific strategy. And 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 what that what that strategy began with was a discussion of the assumptions that that on which previous policies were based that now are, were demonstrably false, and then and then posited a set of of uh, of alternative assumptions, and uh, and I think it's a great example of the application of strategic empathy to this pro- competition with China, uh, and I think this is an approach that, it, that has tremendous bipartisan support as a result, and and I think will carry on across multiple presidential administrations. Well, that idea of questioning assumptions to me also is very philosophical, right? I think when I look at your work about Vietnam, what you really see is, you know, multiple presidential administrations refusing to question the obviously failing or or flawed assumptions right in front of them. And if you want to look at it sort of a history on repeat, that, that's also the history of humanity. It's we make an assumption about something and instead of re-examining it in, you know, continually in the light of new evidence, we stick to it, we cling to it, despite all evidence to the contrary. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to try to put in a process to compensate for these flaws, right? And and uh, what I did as National Security Advisor, and I described this a little bit in the conclusion of the, of the book is, you know, armed with, as I mentioned earlier, the recognition of what went wrong in Vietnam, we, we put into place a, a, you know, a different meeting, you know, for for the principals committee of the National Security Council. This is the president's cabinet, you know, the, who, who are relevant to a particular problem or any issues of foreign policy or national security. And this framing session uh, re- really just aimed to ensure that we understood, you know, the nature of this challenge to our, to our security and our prosperity uh, and then, and then to uh, to first understand it on its own terms, to identify what vital interests were at stake, to craft an overarching goal and more specific objectives, but importantly, to list out the assumptions on which we think a strategy and our policy should would be based, 
And then we then we uh, then we listed uh, then we listed the uh, what we saw were the were obstacles to progress and opportunities to exploit. And it just stopped there. We didn't talk about in the first part of this meeting. Hey, what are we going to do about it? Right. We talked about the framing. You know, this is what people, the people call now design thinking. But you know, the framing of, of this of this challenge, and everybody had a chance to comment on it. And then we said, okay, what are your ideas then? If you agree now with this framing, modified based on the discussion, how do we integrate our efforts, the all elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners? Uh, to, to overcome the obstacles and take advantage of the opportunities. Then you get kind of a high level discussion about how to integrate diplomatic efforts with military efforts and intelligence and law enforcement and economic efforts and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and that was, I think, immensely important, Ryan, because you know what we do is we rush to action a lot of times, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't really understand the nature of the problem. And then therefore we confuse activity with progress. Yeah. I had uh, the historian Tom Ricks on the podcast a, a couple months back and, and, uh, his his book, First Principles. Obviously, I'm familiar with the concept, but I think the concept there is really important, both politically, personally, which is how often are you going back to first principles and going, hey, what do I believe here? What are my assumptions? What's my understanding of the underlying facts here? And then making sure that you measure what you're doing, the actions you're taking, the things you're thinking about, the policies you're developing, making sure that it's consistent with those first principles. Absolutely. And, and, and I think it's important because you, these things can kind of take on a life of their own yes. to subject, you know, these assumptions uh, and to also subject any kind of metrics you come up with measures of effectiveness that you come up with to kind of a routine assessment. Right. So it, this doesn't happen in government that much, but we you know, we set up a schedule for it. And you know, I think my successor dismantled all this. So it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. But 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 uh, who, who who I think. Uh, had more you know, confidence maybe in his own ability to provide advice rather than a, a process to give interdisciplinary um, perspectives and, and best advice across the departments and agencies to the president. But, but, uh, but I think, you know, I, I think you have to set almost a, you know, of course, events can happen that cause you to re, to reframe and challenge your sure. But, but I think it's worth marking, put a mark on a calendar just saying, okay, every six months, I'm going to return to these assumptions and, and, and to, to look at these metrics and, and to put a system in place to do that. Well, that goes to that idea of stillness. How often do you have time in your life for reflection, for questioning, for mm-hmm. you know sitting down and thinking about what you think? And I think a lot of us are so busy, we're going so fast that we don't. We go, I don't have time to read books. I don't have time to have this interdisciplinary discussion. And <laughs> and it might be true you don't have time, but I no. assure you, the consequences of not having time are going to cost you a lot more time that you don't have. Absolutely. You know, you know, one of the one of the fun parts of, of uh, the jobs national security advisors, I got to talk with all the previous national security advisors and and uh, one who was gracious enough to visit me. And I think in my first week on the job was Henry Kissinger, you know, and and I, and I asked him a question, Ryan, I said, hey, how did you find time to to read and to think and uh, think more deeply about about uh, the work that you do in, in, in this position? And he said, you know, in that accent, he said, in this job, you cannot. He said, he said, in this job, you will not create any new knowledge. You will consume the knowledge you already have. Interesting. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't find that to really be the case. He was, he right. was saying that, I think, tongue in cheek, you know, but, right. but I, you know, I was, I was, uh, I had the opportunity, obviously, to, to have wide ranging discussions. I think it's the way you structure your day, right? So instead of you sitting at the end of a big conference table and saying, okay, I'm ready to be briefed. Right? Yeah. I mean, set it up like a discussion, you know, do it around a round table, you know, and uh, I think oftentimes, too, in government, especially they, people have meetings, they, they, they meeting each other to death. Well, right. how about a working session? Like, how about a, how about some whiteboards around here? You know, how about right. instead of sitting around a, in like a re- relatively sterile conference room with people putting up PowerPoint slides? Why don't we have a collaborative workspace, you know, where we can maybe write some papers in advance, share them, discuss them. You know, you know I mean, I, you know, I, I think that the way that we structure interactions is really important. Uh, I think that uh, one way to do it, like when I was in the job, I would walk across to the executive office building where, where each of the directorates were housed uh, out of the West Wing and meet in, in their own spaces, right? Where they're right. more comfortable and, 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 uh, and have discussions that, that I think were immensely helpful to me 
Um, and I think to them as well, right? Because then I could share with them that, you know, the president's priorities and what, what, you know, what I think that, you know, what I think, how we ought to prioritize our efforts to, to craft a new policy or to, to react to a, a series of events in a particular region. Well, my philosophy is you don't find the time, you make the time. And if you yeah. don't make it, it's not going to happen. One of the other books that I connected with uh, Sheikh Tanun about was, was Cal, Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, which he said he reads uh, on a regular basis. He was telling me he has like a, a room he goes to that's almost pitch black, no interruptions. And it's where he sets aside time to think and reflect and, and do the, the tasks that require deep concentration. Because if the leader is not doing that, if the leader is not taking time to think big picture, who do, who do you think is doing it, right? It's, not, right? it's not the people below you. That big picture thinking isn't going to filter up to you. Right. And as you know, I mean, if, if you're writing a book, Ryan, I mean, you can't do it like in in half hour increments. You no. know, I mean, I, it takes a period of long contemplation. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm you're making me feel guilty now because I'm kind of failing at this. Man. <laughs> since, so I'm working on another book. And since Battlegrounds has come out, I mean, I've been talking about Battlegrounds sure. too much. I need to put my I need to really get into like the a deep work space myself. Right. And uh, and, and and start really uh, kicking off into this next project. But but, you're, you know, I think you're right. It's, and, and what you do, I think when you when you do deep work and you think, and you're, you're more contemplative, you start to make connections that you otherwise yes. would miss, right? And then, and certainly I think what you do is you, you begin to discern opportunities uh, because I, I think you do see the obstacle first, right? And it takes thinking, it, it, ta it takes imagining how, how others can be brought in, you know, yes. and, and how you can approach obstacles from a different angle or different perspective and, and or, or make, make the obstacle irrelevant to you, you know, and, and, uh, and so I, I, I think that you're right. I mean, this is what we're missing in this electronically connected world. I mean, I, we, are, we are more connected to one another electronically than ever before, but I think distant from one another uh, emotionally, psychologically, and, and uh, we don't have the kind of discussions like we're having. I mean, who has that these days, right? It's all sound bites and, and reaction to, well, it was always reaction to the last outrageous thing that Donald Trump did. I don't know what, <laughs> what, what are we going to do now, right? So, I, but, but I think uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it's all about sort of superficial, you know, breaking news that is never really breaking news anyway. Uh, and it's it's people sitting around tables talking at each other, you know, in a very superficial way. I I really think, gosh, I worry about the younger generation. You know, they've you know, I hope that they're reading and thinking and discussing you know, philosophy and, and history. No, it's funny. Like if you and I had connected and we said, hey, let's get on the phone and you know meet each other. We would never have an hour long conversation like this. Uh, we yeah. we talk on the phone for 15 minutes. And and it's really, though, these sort of in-depth philosophical discussions. Cato famously would, would have these big sort of philosophical dinner parties. Um, I've met Peter Thiel a few times. That's what, He sort of has these, he brings these people in and he just has, yeah. you know, a six hour dinner conversation. And I think right. that's really where you can you, you know, obviously you, you wake up in the morning and you work on whatever you're supposed to be working on, but it might be an idea that comes to you at dinner, an idea that comes to you at the gym or an idea on a walk with a friend that unlocks whatever it is that you're struggling with. Right. I, absolutely. And, you know, I'll tell you I, what I've found. I don't know how it is with you, but I, these ideas come to me and I think, OK, I'll, I won't remember that, but got to write it down. It, yeah. I've got to write it down. I've got to get better at that. You know, I've got to get better at that. So, so I, I've been I've been paddleboarding here lately, you know, so I need to bring a waterproof, uh, waterproof notepad with me. <laughs> I, I had a I had a question for you. We were talking about this idea that, you know, whatever position you're in, someone's been in that before. And then we were talking about some strategic empathy. I'm, I'm curious. So one of the things I'm fascinated in with stoicism and obviously I can't go back and ask the stoics, but, you know, Seneca is this fascinating figure to me because here you have this incredibly wise, thoughtful, virtuous, disciplined person who gets the, you know, he gets the call. He's asked to serve his country to advise the, the, the future emperor. And for a while it goes well, you know, he's, uh, he's, he, the, 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 his student seems to be interested in learning. He writes him these wonderful essays. They talk. Seneca is this sort of guiding, calming influence at the beginning of Nero's reign. In fact, almost like the first five years of it, historians have very little to complain about. But then, you know, it starts to go off the rails. Uh, he stops listening to the advice. 
And so historians have long speculated, like, why did Seneca stay? Why didn't he leave? You know, was he the adult in the room or was he complicit? Right. There's all these sort of questions. Yeah. As someone who's been in a similar position, what do you think is going through Seneca's mind as he watches yeah. the as he watches Nero and as he evaluates his own career prospects and culpability? Like what, what yeah. insights can you give me about the past from your experiences in the present? Sure. Well, this was this was a big, you know, you know, uh, issue uh, with with you know, some of my friends, you know, when I, when I was going to co- go into the Trump administration, you know, uh, these are people who were adamantly against President Trump. These weren't people in the military. There are people outside the military, some academics and so forth, people that I've known for years, some friendships I lost, actually, you know, but but I think it begins with really understanding what your role is. Right. So for me, you know, I you know, I. I swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States when I was 17 years old, uh, when I entered West Point. And I took kind of the extreme position of never voting. I just never voted, Ryan, because I followed George Marshall's example of not doing so to keep that bold line between the military and partisan politics. So I viewed Donald Trump as the fifth commander in chief I had served under. And, and, um, and I thought if I had the opportunity to help the elected president make better decisions by running an effective national security process, by staffing him effectively, by giving him the benefit of best advice and multiple options developed uh, you know, from across the departments and agencies, uh, that that was a good way for me to have a bonus round in my service to the country. So, so that's what I endeavored to do, you know, and, and, um, and what, you know, of course, you know, this is a disrupting, dis- disruptive to many people, a very offensive uh, leader uh, who did not read The Ego is the Enemy, I don't think. <laughs> and, I'm not sure he read and, uh, very many books at all. <laughs> and, and uh, but, but, you know, I, I understood what my role was, right? Nobody elected me, right? I still was a three-star general uh, in the Army, Lieutenant General in the Army. Um, and, and so it wasn't my job to make policy. And if I did, if I was kind of the adult in the room who tried to block the president from something the president was lawfully you know, could lawfully do as the chief executive or as the commander in sure. chief, then I was undermining the sovereignty of the American people, right? Because because only the president and the vice president in that executive branch are really directly accountable to the American people. And if we believe that sovereignty lies with the people, then then those who assume the role of of trying to manipulate decisions consistent with their own agenda or of obstructing, like the you know this is this the anonymous writer of obstructing sure. the president's decisions and policies, they're actually undermining the Constitution. So I think understanding of role would be the way I'd, I'd answer that. But then also I made the assessment. I made the assessment of, am I making a positive difference? Right. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and am I being asked to do anything that's, you know, unethical or, you know, illegal? So if the answer to the first one is yes, and the, and the second one is no, I was going to continue to serve because it was my duty. It was my duty to serve. And, and I, I had really this, this benefit, as I mentioned, of writing Dereliction of Duty, you know, the book about how why Vietnam became an American war. And one of the curious things I found through historical research is that during the period in which Vietnam became an American war, many of Lyndon Johnson's advisors concluded, hey, we have to tell the president only what the president wants to hear. Right. Because he, you know, he was basing Vietnam decisions based on his domestic agenda, and he saw Vietnam principally as a danger to his domestic goals. Uh, but also because they concluded, hey, I've got to maintain my influence with the president. Right. Well, it, of course, begs the question, right? If you're not telling the president what you really think, what good is your influence anyway? Sure. So I, I never held back, right? And so uh, there were people who thought that that was, you know, foolhardy or, you know, that I didn't have the emotional intelligence to know that President Trump didn't want to hear some things I was telling him. I, of course I knew that. <laughs> I mean, and, and I didn't drone on, on long briefings. I tried to, I tried to have really succinct, um, you know, give him a, you know, succinctly the perspective that I thought was necessary. Like, hey, Mr. President, if we put, if we put tariffs on all, all of our allies, you know, uh, that's counterproductive because if we shoot all of our allies to get to China, China wins. You know, I mean, so, sure. so maybe, that wasn't maybe what he wanted to hear. Uh, but but it was my duty to tell him that, and not just and just just what I thought, but what what the what the um, the advice was, or or the, the best analysis from across departments and agencies of our government, and maybe from some of our like minded partners abroad. So hey, I knew I was going to get used up, Ryan. But you know, in, in a very stoic way, man, I was at peace with that. Right? I was like, okay, you know, I, when I'm finished, I'm finished. 
And, uh, and the way I left, you know, I, I had a, I had a frank conversation with him and I said, Hey, I, I think I'm used up here with you, you know, and uh, I, you know, I want you to succeed. Uh, but I don't think I'm your guy anymore. You know, uh, when are we going to do this? Right. You know, and, uh, and, and so, it, you know, it, it was, a, it was, a you know, it was a, a mature conversation. I wasn't, I wasn't in there, Ryan. Like, you know, I, I think a lot of this goes to base motivation in life. Right. I mean, I wasn't there to get another job. In fact, when I took the job, I decided I was going to retire as a three-star general, right? That was going to be my plan that year in 2017 anyway. And I said, hey, I'm just going to, you know, even if I'm offered, which I was offered to compete for four separate four-star jobs, I, I, I respectfully declined to compete because I decided I'm just going to retire at the end of this and, and go as long and as hard as I can. <laughs> and then, hey, uh, when I'm done, I'll try to help my successor succeed. I think the president was uh, actually kind of uh, surprised when, you know, I knew that he was going to call me that uh, that afternoon to tell me that he had selected John Bolton. Yeah. Right. And and uh, and I said, hey, Mr. President, I'm, I want him to succeed. You know, when is he coming on? You know, I'll, I'll serve till he comes in and we'll have a smooth handoff, you know, and I did everything I could to to make that happen. Spent time with Ambassador Bolton and so forth and, you know, set up all sorts of briefings for him, because I think, you know, if you, if your ego is under control, Ryan, right, you realize, hey, these jobs, right? Your duties, your responsibilities, they're much bigger than any one individual, right? Yeah. And you, you hope the president gets that as well. Uh, you know, I don't, th- I don't think president Trump actually got that memo, you know, on that, but, uh, but I, I think, um, anyway, sorry to go on about it. No. It, it, it. You got me thinking obviously. And, but I, I, you know, there are those who said, Hey, you should never have done it. Uh, you know, I, I would still do it again today. You know, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I think his behavior became more and more aberrant. Um, after I left, not that I was putting a cap on it. I think it was just a natural uh, you know, evolution of, of his his presidency, you know, beginning with kind of the Helsinki conference and then, you know, then, you know, a lots, lots of other aberrational activity and denying the outcome of the election, the, you know, the, the, the um, reinforcement of conspiracy theories and so forth and, and uh, false claims of widespread, you know, widespread fraud. And then, and then, you know, encouraging this assault on the Capitol. So, um, yeah, I can really only talk about that first 13 months. No, I, I think what I'm so fascinated with with Seneca is that 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 it life is complicated, right? You know, the, it's it's easy to be the philosopher academically. It's easy to be perhaps even just in the in the more contained world of uh, of of your industry or in your case the military. But then the rubber has to meet the road where we we. We have to do these things in the real world. And, and there's a fascinating book called Dying Every Day about Seneca and Nero's court by James Rom, who's a writer I love. And, and you know, he's just talking about, um, you know, was, was Seneca motivated by selfishness or selflessness? And it's probably different parts on different days. And I think, you know, human beings are complicated and we find ourselves I was offered a, a a job as a as a spokesperson to a cabinet secretary, and I'm big not a uh, Trump supporter. And and what surprised me was even that I considered taking the job, right? And yeah. and and that's that. I think that's also where some of these first principles and you said the base motivations. What? Why do I do what I do? What motivates me? You know, and so you can evaluate these opportunities and dilemmas as they as they come along. Yeah. Well, you've read about this thing. What do your books? You have a chapter on, on, on uh, you know, being you know, being part of something bigger than yourself, right? Yes. And uh, and you use Admiral Stockdale, who's uh, mm-hmm. a hero of mine, who I got to know. In fact, one of my fondest memories was being in the hot tub with Admiral Stockdale. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a Vietnam War conference, you know, and, and as you know, he had been you know severely tortured, and mm-hmm. it, it was always in pain, and and so uh, so I went down to work out in the hotel gym. And uh, and and he was in the hot tub. He said, "I'm not missing this opportunity." So I jumped in the hot tub with him, and had a long, a long conversation with him, and and uh, and got to know him a little bit better than over over the years. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I mean, talk about you know applied philosophy. Uh, he's a great example of that. Well, I mean, even backing up from from his time as a POW, he he was, from what I understand, had very few illusions about the the righteousness of the vietnam war he witnessed the gulf of tonkin incident and you know yeah. sort of saw it for what it was and and so and yet there there he was flying you know uh flying missions over vietnam and then shot down and taken prisoner and so there did seem to be the ability 
you could you could say it's philosophical or the opposite of I guess it depends on where you come down of his ability to compartmentalize his personal feelings from his sense of duty. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the question to ask is, what is your sense of duty, right? And and of course, I think one of the great gifts of our democracy, you know, is that we that that we you know that we do have a say in in how we're governed, right? That 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 uh, all of us. Um, I think can apply a corrective, you know, well short of, of revolution, right? Yeah. Just by voting, right? Or demanding better from, you know, from our political leadership. Uh, and then I think another great gift is, is that, you know, our military does swear allegiance to our constitution, right? Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, we saw that our, our democratic institutions and processes put to a stress test in this past year. And I think we came out pretty strong, you know, and I, I think that, that, that uh, you know, that, we had an adjudicative process uh, within the judicial branch of government, mainly at the state level, to adjudicate any of the claims of uh, you know of uh, you know of uh, false results or or or, uh, or corruption in the election process, and then and then you had you know you had I think some key leaders you know in in both parties show some effective leadership. I think uh, McConnell's speech you know the day of the assault on the Capitol I think was was very powerful as was the vice president's behavior and, and, and response to it as well. So anyway, I, I think that, you know, that there is a sense of duty uh, that can transcend this vitriolic partisanship we've seen. And I think it's really important that, that we appeal to that ourselves and in our communities, you know, that we, you know, that we, that we rediscover the ability to empathize with one another, to have meaningful civil discussions about, uh, about the, the issues that are important to the future of all of our children and grandchildren and, and uh, and I think we demand that kind of a civil discourse from our political leadership as well. Yeah. And one last thing before I let you go. One of the things I've been talking to people about is, you know, people go, why didn't the Republicans impeach or, you know, why didn't so and so take this stand or, you know, why doesn't so and so just do this? And and I, there is truth to that. As voters, we have to hold people accountable. And and as you said, uh, you know, officials uh, swear an oath to protect and, and to serve. But but. I think as philosophers and as students of history, we have to study these things with, with one thing in mind, which is how do you apply it in your own life? So, you know, it's so easy to go, you know, why didn't these spineless officials do X, Y, or Z? To me, what I want to take from that is, you know, how often do I risk my job for matters of principle? How often am I willing to say things that will make me unpopular with friends or family? How often am I willing to do a, a thing that I sense is my duty, even if it comes at a great expense to me uh, personally, professionally, physically? Um, right. I think at the end of the day, we have to study Seneca or the dilemma you were talking about in your life or, or what's happening on the news and say, this is all great theoretically and historically, but how am I applying these lessons in my own life? Absolutely. And, and then also to think about, you know, what, what is in our power, right? I mean, yes. it, was, it, was it Aristotle who said it is only worth discussing what is in our power, right? And, and I think what we, what we have to do, we all have a role in this. We all have a role in, I think, you know, arresting this destructive interaction uh, in, 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 between identity politics or whatever you want to call it and bigotry and racism. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think what the, what the Stoic philosophers can teach us as well as they can teach us more about our, our common humanity yes. and, and help us understand better, even though you're not even supposed to say this anymore, uh, that, that, uh, that, that what defines you uh, is much deeper than the pigmentation of your skin, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Sure. And, um, and so I, I think that, you know, the, the Stoic philosophers can help us become better people and then also be a, a source of strength for our society. Yeah, that's right. Instead of decrying what you see happening in some other state or on the news or this sort of general global or federal trend, it's also like, what are you doing in your neighborhood? What are you doing with your kids? What are you doing in your yeah. house and in your relationships? Right. Right. I mean, are, are you outraged about inequality of opportunity and the soft bigotry of low expectations and and racial barriers to, to, to you know, to be able to realize the American dream? Hey, you know, Boys and Girls Club, America, yeah, you sure. know, I mean, all sorts of all sorts of ways to get involved, you know, that that can make a real difference in real people's lives. You know, I think 
that's the great strength of our country is that we have this entrepreneurial spirit. We have this, you know, th this individualistic spirit that we have can be, you know, you know it, it, it can be, uh, there are disadvantages to it, right? It, it, especially when you say, hey, just wear a mask, man. We, yeah, I mean, right, you know, but, right. but hey, but you know, you know, but, but there's an advantage to this, right? That we ought to maximize, right? This idea that we can all make a difference and, and, and we have this great benefit of living in a, where we have freedom of speech, we, we live under rule of law, we have to fear somebody breaking down our door, you know, without, uh, without uh, cause, um, parting us away somewhere, you know, we, we, we have the ability to, to change, you know, our part, our lives, people around us in, in a positive way. I, I love it. Yeah. It, what, what can you do in your life with your decisions? And as, as, uh, as Epictetus says, what can you do with the matters that are up to me and disregard yeah. the matters that are not up to me? Right, right. Exactly. General, thank you so much. Hey, Ryan, thank you. I'm a big fan, I'm telling you. I've got, I just wanna show you, I just wanna show you. Look, I got right, got right here. Eagle is the enemy, obstacle the way, tabbed, tabbed. Oh, I love so, it. And lives of Stokes, man. So I, great I, to be I, with you. Thanks for making philosophy so accessible and, and I think, I think, you know, reading your books, I think can enrich people's lives. So it's great to meet you. And I look forward to continuing the conversation at some point. I, I, I totally agree. I'm a fan of your work and thank you for, for, uh, you know, doing the unpleasant work of trying to apply philosophical ideas at the, at the highest <laughs> levels of, of government and, and power. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Thanks. Well. we'll talk soon.